Okay, good evening everyone. Um, as you can see, I've uh, prepared a PowerPoint for tonight. So I'm going to stand right here. If you can't see the PowerPoint, you may want to move to another spot where you can see, because there's going to be at least one photo that you're really going to want to see in this presentation tonight. So uh, suspense is going to kill you. <laughs> All right, so everybody can see it, it looks like. All right. We will start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds this evening as we learn about Eucharistic adoration, how we can love and adore you in the Eucharist. Help us to draw closer to you, and help us to experience your love for us. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. So, uh, this happens to be my last presentation for Family Faith Formation. So, I thought I would do a PowerPoint, just as kind of a going away gift. I know, I know it's the last one. You can dry your tears now. We'll get over this. We can, we can move beyond. Okay, so I like to start my presentations with a uh, let's see with a scripture verse. We're going to go to Matthew twenty-eight uh, twenty. Matthew twenty-eight twenty, and this is uh, this is a after Jesus rose from the dead. And he's with his disciples. And these are kind of, this is are his last words in the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus gives a promise in this last verse. And we're going to see how this promise gets filled, at, fulfilled in Eucharistic adoration tonight. So, uh, would somebody be willing to read uh, Matthew 28, 20? Not everybody has to read at the same time, so just one volunteer. Thank you. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. Okay, so that last sentence is the promise. Behold, I am with you until the end of the age, till the close of the age. Jesus promises us. Hey, I'm going to be with you until the end of the age. Now, I don't know about you all, but uh, you know, I haven't like exactly been walking around here in Algon or Whittemore and like running into Jesus and being like, hey, what well, hey, man, Jesus, great to see you. We don't like having Jesus walking around with us. So how does this promise get fulfilled? He promises us. I'm going to be with you until the end of the age. So we see one way that Jesus fulfills his promise is in Eucharistic adoration, where Jesus left us the Eucharist. Now, Eucharistic adoration is spending time with Jesus outside of Mass. Adoring Jesus in the Eucharist, the same communion that we have in Mass, but adoring him outside, loving him outside of being there at Mass itself. Now, let's try to trace this, and let's look at how did this get started? Because actually the roots go way back, and we're going to go to the, this is going to go way back in the Old Testament. We're going to go to Exodus, now 25, Exodus 25. We're going to learn a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 25, verses, verse 10, and then we're going to skip down to verse 22. Now this is after Moses took the people across the Red Sea. And this is after, uh, and this is now God giving Moses some instructions of things he wants to build. And one of the things God wants to Moses to build and have for the Israelite people is what's called the Ark 
of the covenant. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna see just we're, we're gonna read just verse ten, and then we're gonna skip down to twenty. So verse ten, would somebody like to read that, please? Yes. Okay, so it says make an ark of a kale wood and make it two and a half cubits wide. And then he goes on in verses 11 on down to say plate it in pure gold and make it basically look like this in the end. A gold box with on top of it two angels with their wings stretched out into the middle. So this is what was called the Ark of the Covenant, and then inside the Ark of the Covenant, they put the most important things for the Israelites. They put the, the tablets with the Ten Commandments. They put uh, the, the, the manna, the bread that they ate every single day. They put the rod of, the, uh, of Aaron. Uh, later, they would put in the book of Deuteronomy. But here we have the Ark of the Covenant, and now we're going to skip down to verse 22 because there's something special that happens with the Ark of the Covenant. Down in verse 22. Do I read that? Yes, please. There I will meet you there, from above the majority, and there from above priority. Between the two cherubim on the ark and the commandments, I will tell you all the commands I wish you to give the Israelites. Okay, so they say above the propos. Uh, I can not say that word very well. Pro pro uh, pro yeah, the P word. Okay. <laughs> and above it, you have the two cherubim. The two cherubim are the two angels. He says, between the two cherubims, I will tell you the commandments. So this is like a place of meaning. This is a meaning place for God. God comes here to meet the people. So Moses and the priests, they would come into this special tent where the Ark of the Covenant was, and this is where they met God, where they had encounters with God, where God would tell commandments, God would tell them what to do, God would give them what his desires were. It was a meeting place of God. Alright, so now we're also going to learn about a second thing that they had to do. This we're same chapter, Exodus 25. We're going to learn a little bit about the bread of presence. So this is Exodus 25. We're skipping down to uh, uh, verse 23. Does somebody else want to read verse 23, please? Yes? We do have daycare now, so if any of the kids want to come, I know there's a couple of them here. If daycare is more interesting than my presentation, you're free to go to. <laughs> so verse 23, would somebody like to read that? Yes. You shall also make a table of Acadia wood, two cubits long, a cubic wide, and a cubic and a half high. Okay. And basically, again, the next verse is say, plate it in pure gold, make it look like this. And then skip down to verse 30. On the table you shall always keep showbread set before me. So they, God tells them, you should always keep showbread. And that showbread becomes called the, the bread of presence. They were always, and it was, uh, it was the man, it was to remind them of the bread that they ate. It was to remind them that God was taking care of them, but that also God was with them. So God was not only feeding them physically with bread, but God was also feeding them spiritually. And they were always to have this bread of presence there. It was kept right in the middle of the community, in the tent next to the Ark of the Covenant. So as you can see, like, some of the things that we do as Catholics, how we keep the Eucharist, 
In a, a tabernacle, we, we keep the bread that's changed into the body and blood. We can see that the roots of what we do go all the way back into the Old Testament. So as Catholics, we, we see that our, we have very Jewish roots, and they, they stretch all the way through the Bible. Okay, so let's move on to, let's kind of fast forward to the presence of Jesus. So that was the way God in the Old Testament was present with the people in the Ark of the Covenant, the bread of the presence. But then comes into the world God himself, Jesus himself. And Jesus comes in, and we begin to see that people adore Jesus. They love Jesus. They do him homage. They worship him. And, we, and I've just uh, gathered a few pictures of like scenes from the life of Jesus to, to start to get the feel that people have this certain respect, this love, this adoration for Jesus. So this is the Magi, the first one here. The Magi, remember the, the three Magi that came and gave gifts, but it says they knelt down and did him homage. They were adoring this Jesus. And then here's just a picture of, of Jesus teaching. Now you can imagine he was a real dynamic teacher. He was a powerful preacher. And you can imagine just people kind of gazing at him and soaking in his words and, and adoring the teacher as he taught. He commanded their attention. He, they, he was such a great uh, he was a, such a great speaker that they adored him. And you can kind of just see people absorbed, looking at him. They respected him. Okay? We now have and then wait, here's a couple other scenes from the life of Jesus that are important. So this is the first one over here is the agony in the garden. Now the reason I picked this one out, you don't really see the apostles uh, adoring Jesus. If you kind of remember the story, uh, Jesus says to him, hey, you guys stay here and, and watch and pray. And then Jesus goes off and he's like intense in prayer. He's like, Take this, take this from me, this suffering from me. And he comes back, and what does he find the disciples? They're asleep. And he says to them, could you not stay awake and watch and pray for one hour? So here we have the idea, we're beginning to see the idea of staying awake and praying with Jesus for an hour. That's oftentimes where we get the idea of a holy hour, or like we have the Adoration Chapel here at St. Cecilia's. People go in and stay for an hour. Okay? And then we also, here's another image. This is of the resurrection. We're in Easter time now. And so this is when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. And it says when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene fell down, did him homage, and grabbed his feet. She was adoring this Jesus who rose from the dead. Now, I want you to step back for a second and think about how did Jesus feel toward these people who were loving him, who were adoring him? What might have been going on inside of his heart when he would see people fall at his feet? When they would come begging him. When, when, they, when they bow down in homage. How might Jesus have felt? I imagine he had an outpouring of like, I, I love this person. This is beautiful that they're, they're coming and showing me so much love and respect. Now, I want you to step back and keep that. Look at from the vantage point of the Father. Of God the Father, how might God the Father have looked down upon the people adoring Jesus? When he saw these people just loving Jesus and adoring him, I'm sure he was like, yes, they love my son. They respect my son. They come to my son. They're giving everything to my son. The Father would be delighting. And the fact that people are doing Jesus' adoration, they're, 
they're giving him homage. They're respecting Jesus. Okay, so that's that's sort of like how it is between see Jesus and 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 people coming to him. Now imagine, whoops, you didn't see that. <laughs> Oops. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the uh, the next uh, next little story, um, next little point. I have a. Uh, it's actually actually comes from my high school prom. So um, the story comes from my high school prom, and as you kind of glimpsed a little bit, I for your amusement tonight, I drug out a picture from my high school prom. So you can all kind of see and get a little giggle or whatever. So here we are in a classic high school prom pose, <laughs> pretending we're the mafia. <laughs> Big bad boys or high school seniors, okay? There we are. Now, I also intentionally picked this picture, and not the picture of um, my high school prom date, my girlfriend, because, um, Say this. I didn't want to arouse too much unneeded curiosity among you all. <laughs> so you get this one with the boys. So this story comes from the high school prom. I, I remember being at the prom and I was I was dancing with my girlfriend. And uh, at some point during the night, I I looked over and gazed at this at this other couple who was dancing. And they, they were dancing close, they were boyfriend and girlfriend, and they were dancing real close, and like, it caught my attention that they were just, their, their eyes, their gaze was like, their eyes were locked on each other. They were just looking eye to eye. And I was like, okay. And then I kept dancing, I turned back, and they're still locked <laughs> eye to eye. Okay, and then the song gets over, like, they don't miss a beat, they keep their legates, and next song starts, and they're locked, right? <laughs> eye to eye. They were just gazing at each other deeply. And I remember thinking, all right, well, so I've looked my girlfriend in the eye before, and, um, but that's awkward. <laughs> You know, I've looked her in the eye, but I've never looked her that long in the eye and not in public, okay? Like, they were just, they were just gazing their eye to eye. But that gaze, I think, reveals something. Perhaps you, you all have maybe had a gaze of love, maybe from a spouse. Or maybe you, you've even given a gaze of love like upon a child. And that gaze of love where you look deeply, eye to eye, and something gets expressed there in, in the heart that there's, there's something deeper here. That's a little bit of like what goes on between us humans, this deep affection, this deep adoration, this deep love. And that's, but that's just between us humans. Now take it up to the level between God and us. When Jesus gazes upon us, now our love, our love, our, our gaze of love is, is limited. We're humans. When God gazes with love, it's unlimited. It's perfect. It's a love that penetrates. It's a deep love. A love that's been going on for a long time. It's a love that, that looks at us when we're good. It's a love that looks at us even when we're bad. Even when we're sinning. And that gaze of love that penetrates. That's what goes on in, in adoration. When we come into the presence of God, He gazes upon us. He looks at us with deep love.
God has an unflinching gaze. Like that couple at the dance, they did not flinch. But God's unflinching gaze is, is something deeper than just the <coughs> law of a dating couple. It's deep. It's got richness. It's got It goes on. It's eternal. It doesn't fade after a dance is over. It doesn't fade after after I walk out of the church. God's love keeps going. <clears throat> so now we need to move from like, okay, so this is the gaze of Jesus upon humans. But we know that Jesus is not still walking around. So he's got to prepare us for like, how do we get to today, to 2018, and he can still gaze upon us. So Jesus, um, when he when he was preparing his disciples, he um, a year ahead before he died, he gave this this speech. It's called the Blood of Life Discourse, and we're going to look at it, part of it in John six, the Gospel of John, chapter six. This one's a little longer, so I'll read it out loud so that we can hear it. And I'll pause at various points to, to explain. So this is John 6, 48 and 59. And this is a really important passage for us Catholics. So John uh, 58, uh, John 6, verse 48 starts like this. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. He's referring to the people that came with Moses out of, out of Egypt, and they ate manna for 40 years. But he's saying, look, all of them, they died. They're dead. They're rotted away. But Jesus says, uh, continue on, 50, verse 50, this is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Watch this. 52. The Jews quarreled amongst them, saying, so, say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat. They're thinking, Jesus just said, I'm going to give my flesh to eat. They're thinking, cannibalism. We've got to eat like his skin. We've got to eat his muscles. They're, they're, they're quarreling. They're thinking, how can he do this? I'm not going to go eat this guy. So what does Jesus do to explain? He goes on in verse uh, 53. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you. You don't have to eat. No, he doesn't say that. He says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise it on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the loving Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live Forever. Now Jesus, instead of saying, hey, you don't have to really eat my flesh, he goes on and emphasizes it. He says four times, listen, my, 
my flesh is, is true food. My blood is true drink. If you eat this, you will wait forever. This is true bread. This is true food. He goes on to emphasize four times that, no, you really have to eat. Now, the people at that time, they might have been scratching their heads and trying to figure out, oh, I don't get this. They, they don't understand. A year later, at the Last Supper, it would finally become clear for the disciples. So we're going to move to the Last Supper. We're going to go to Matthew 26. Verse 26 to 28. So this is, this is something we're very familiar with because we hear every Sunday. 26, uh, verse 26 says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. And giving it to his disciples said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus, he knows he's going to die, and he wants to prepare his disciples. He wants to prepare us for when he's no longer walking around. How are we still going to experience him? So he gives us his body and blood and he, the way he does it is he changes bread. He changes wine to be his body and to be his blood. Now, um, Jesus really becomes present at Mass. When the priest is up there, he's not just acting around. When Jesus, when the priest says those words, they, Jesus really becomes present. It's his body, his blood, his whole soul, his whole divinity, his whole being God. Jesus is really there. We call it the real presence. And it's also called transubstantiation, where we change from one substance, being bread, to be a new substance. We trans, by transfer, change over bread to body, wine to blood. It's really Jesus. Now, if you would like to kind of like play around with me or get me really annoyed, um, and if you want to see me uh, like this, <laughs> All you have to do is come up to me. This is what I'll be like on the inside. Come up to me and say, Oh, Father, I just love receiving the wine at Mass. And I'll be like, Oh, <laughs> oh Father, the bread tastes so good. It doesn't taste good. We all know that. <laughs> oh, Father, or a Eucharist minister says to me, Oh, Father, I gave out the bread today. I'm like, oh. Why? Because it's no longer wine. It's no longer bread. What we receive at Mass, it's body. It's Jesus. It, it's not wine. It's not wine. It's, it's, it's blood. It's really him. And so the, the language we say needs to reflect that. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, this, this one time, uh, it was kind of an odd, odd situation. Uh, uh, There's this person who could only receive the precious blood. Uh, and so uh, I had, I had the, the body in my hand, and I, I went over to this person, and the person, the person said to me, uh, I like the wine. I was like, like this. Or I was like, oh. <laughs> okay, and I, like I almost always do, I look very calm on the outside and I do a nice little correction and I'd be like, you mean you like the blood? 
And like the guy was a little hard to hear, and I, I think he, he may have thought, well, Father didn't hear me. So he said, no, I like the wine. And I was like, oh. And, and then I said, you mean you would like the blood? He's like, I'd like the wine. And I'm like, you would like the blood? And he's like, I'd like the wine. And I was like, I'm not getting anywhere with this guy. And pretty soon I'm going to want to rip off his head. And I've got the body of Christ in my hands. I'm just going to go get him the blood. I don't know if I was read in that moment either. I probably was. <laughs> anyway, it's really the body of Jesus. It's really the blood of Jesus. And that belief really affects us. So, now we're going to see, like, okay, so Jesus, he started by giving the body and blood. And when did adoration really start off? The first moments of the adoration actually happened with the early disciples, and it, it still happens with us. Most of us have all done it. Even if we haven't gone to an adoration chapel, we've all done this, and we maybe didn't realize we were doing adoration. Adoration, the first moments of adoration actually happen at Mass. Within the Mass, when the priest gets done, and the body, it's, it's changed into his body. He lifts it up. And we all look at it. We adore it. We love Jesus. We even ring bells. Hey, something special going on here. We all adore and look at Jesus. The same with the blood. We lift it up. We raise it up. We all adore. We love him. Because that's, that's the Jesus who died for me on the cross. That's the Jesus who lost me. That's the Jesus who gave his, his body and blood. That's him. I, I love him. We adore him right there at Mass. That's when the first moments of Eucharistic adoration happened. When the apostles were celebrating those first Masses. And it continues to go on even today where we have adoration at Mass. But then we also see early in the church that when the first apostles were celebrating Mass, they would, they would often take, they would take um, pieces of the body of Jesus and they would reserve it. They would hold it back in a special place so that later they could go take it and give it to those who were sick, those who were invalid, the, the people who could not come to Mass. So they would hold that and they would reserve it in a tabernacle. And they would, the early Christians, they would love and respect Jesus right there in the tabernacle. So that's where we see also the, the next phase of like adoration. We see Jesus being adored in a tabernacle where the body of Jesus would be kept back for those who were sick and unable to come. And the priest and the, and the people would respect and adore Jesus there in a tabernacle. <clears throat> now, as we, as we continue to like, look into like, this, this idea of adoring Jesus, um, there was uh, Pope Benedict did some, some he had a really nice reflection of trying to help us understand adoration. And what he did was he looked at adoration of, of Jesus in, in the Eucharist from the two, uh, two words, uh, adoration in Greek and adoration in Latin. Now, in, in Greek, um, the word is pros, uh, proskisnesis, which means to, like, to prostrate oneself down in homage, to kind of like fall down on our face and be like, God, you are so awesome. You are incredible. To just bow down before God and realize the God is, he is the God of the universe. He is the God of everything. I am like, I need to fall on my face. I am so small before this God. 
That's adoration in Greek. And then adoration in Latin. The Latin word is ad oratio, which means mouth to mouth. Like a holy kiss. So you have this like this sense of like this intimacy. I'm close with God. We have this interchange where my mouth is upon his mouth, or his mouth is gazing upon my mouth. We're so close that our eyes are are caught. So here we have like this, this balance between like I'm falling down before the God of the universe. I am adoring in complete awe of this awesome God. And then there's this intimacy, this closeness, this God who's so great, but yet I'm very close. Like a holy kiss. That's the idea of adoration. It gets kind of all summed up those two in, in one. Okay, so how do we kind of, today we have like adoration in, in a monster, so which looks, looks something like this, where oftentimes it's kind of, uh, we have the body of Jesus right in the middle, and we'll have kind of like a gold star, and or like some, some sort of way to accentuate, or make it glorious, and make it look good. So that's called a monstrance, and the word in Latin, monstrare, means to show. So we're showing off Jesus. So here we have, how do we get to this? Well, it all kind of started with a, a controversy in a church where there was this, uh, there was this, um, this priest called uh, Berengar of Tours. Not important, except that he brought about this. This guy, Berengar of, of Tours, he, he denied transubstantiation. He denied that the substance of bread really changes into be the substance of the body. And so uh, he, he, was, he was wrong, and the Pope kind of came down on him and said, hey, you've got re- you to change your position. And, but what happened was, because this controversy got stirred up and everybody was thinking about it, they, they, they thought, this is, this is important. The body and blood is really important. And so they wanted to like exalt it to say, hey, you know, we believe that that's Jesus. We believe that that's the body of Jesus. So they exalted it, and what they started to do was say, we're going to show it to the world. So they started showing it. And when people come to adore, they say, now, come, come now, love Jesus. We love it. He's, this is his body. So come here and start adoring him and loving him. And that's when they started extending time of adoration exposed like this. So normally there's, there's two ways of adoration. In the tabernacle, that's the most common, that's it's right, Jesus is right there. But then also we have adoration like, like this, sort of like you would find in our adoration chapel at St. Cecilia's. Um, but I, I want to close with a little story of uh, my first experience of Eucharistic adoration. I was, um, I was 15, and I went to a, a student of youth conference, and uh, they, they were preparing us for Eucharistic adoration like, like this. And they, they just came, they had, came out and said, you know, um, Jesus has got to come here and be with us now. And I was like, at at 15, I was like, Jesus? That Jesus I hear about in the Bible? He's he's got to come here and be with us? I was like, whoa, this is awesome. And then 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 they started explaining, you know, Jesus, at the Last Supper, he gave us his body and blood. He he changed the bread to be his body and the, 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 the wine to be his blood. And we have, we have it here. And suddenly, like, it, it clicked for me. What goes on in, in Mass? That's, that's Jesus. And so they, they brought out Jesus in adoration. And I just remember thinking, that's, that's Jesus. That's, that's God. He 
wants to be here with me. And I remember just kind of pouring out my heart in prayer, like, like, a, like a 15 year old woman, just being, like, just pouring out my heart. And what I received from, 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 from Jesus there in that original was just a very simple message, but so important. I just, I just knew that God loved me. Jesus loved me so much that he wanted to be right here with me. And to touch my heart. I was adoring him, but he was giving to me his love. Folks, that's, that's what happens in the Eucharistic adoration. We, we come to him, but he really he comes to us. He gives us his love. Jesus is worth 